From their childhoods, it is common knowledge to most Chinese that rivers typically flow from west to east, following their country's topography, which slopes downwards in the same direction. One great man-made waterway does not follow this rule. The Grand Canal, stretching for 1,794 kilometers, runs almost due south from Beijing at a latitude of 39 degrees north to Hangzhou at 30.3 degrees north, with its longitude starting at 116 degrees east and ending at 120 degrees east. Today's technology allows us to survey it in its entirety. More than before, we can understand how a man-made waterway, appearing so calm as it winds through central and eastern China, represents an achievement that once seemed utterly impossible. Even at its northernmost point in Beijing, building the canal already looks impossible. At the time, grain transported up the canal from the south could only reach Zhangjiawan. Beyond it, cargoes had to be offloaded and transported by cart and donkey, making for an inefficient final leg before the capital. In 1292, the Yuan Dynasty astronomer, mathematician, and engineer Guo Shoujing arrived at Zhangjiawan port in Tongzhou, 30 kilometers east of Beijing. His attention was focused on a gap in the Grand Canal. During the Yuan Dynasty, Nearly a decade was devoted to excavating the Shandong section of the Grand Canal, transforming it from an east-west, V-shaped route centered around the city of Luoyang to a straighter north-south route, running from the capital directly to Hangzhou. Although it was intended to connect Beijing and Hangzhou, in practice, the canal did not fully achieve this goal. Ships traveling northward from the south could only reach as far as Tongzhou, to the east of the capital, rather than directly into Beijing itself. Because of the landscape, which slopes down from west to east, and the monsoon climate with its dry winters and springs, it was always a challenge to find a stable water supply for the final stretch of the canal, from Tongzhou to the imperial city in the Beijing area. Attempts were made during the Liao and Jin periods, but all ended in failure. Guo Shoujing, a scientist of equivalent to present-day academician rank and formerly the nation's director of waterways of Yuan Dynasty, returned to the water's edge because of this gap. By this time, he was over 60 years old. The capital had a natural water source, the Yongding River. Before the Yuan Dynasty, it had been used to supply water to the canal. Liaojin 
但是呢，含沙量又特别大，巨量的泥沙进入渠道以后，很快就淤浅了。所以说，当郭守敬他就注意到这个问题，那么他就想要开辟一条新的有水源的河道，而且呢，能够有蓄水工程的地方。Was there another option? About 50 kilometers north of Beijing, on the edge of the Yinshan mountain range, the Baifu Spring emerges from the eastern foothills of Longshan Mountain. Approximately 20 kilometers southeast of the spring, near the city's northwest boundary, lies Wangshan Lake an ideal candidate for water storage. Gua Shou Jing proposed an innovative solution to the water supply problem. He planned to harness the spring water from the northern hills, channel it to Wangshan Lake for storage, and then directly feed it into the city's canal system. Situated between Baifu Spring and Wangshan Lake is a valley. Following gravity, water from the spring would naturally flow eastward, unable to cross the valley to reach Wangshan Lake. How, then, did Guo Shoujing conceive a watercourse design, enabling the flow of water from Baifu Spring into Wangshan Lake, overcoming the challenging terrain? This is the former site of Baifu Spring which was once a vital source for Beijing's canal system. 700 years have passed, and the secluded waterway that originated here has long since vanished. History of the Yuan Dynasty, Rivers and Canals, records that the Tonghui River originates from Baifu Village in Changping County, drawing water from the Divine Spring, turns west then south, passing through rivers and springs including Shuang Ta, Yuha, Emu, and Yuchuan, to enter the capital through the West Waterborne Gate. In 1964, the Beijing archaeological team, based on historical records, outlined the approximate course of this hidden waterway, the Baifu Wangshan River, although its exact path has always been a matter of dispute. Over the years, Professor Tan Shuming of the China Institute of Water Resources and Hydropower Research has committed herself to uncovering the route through historical records and field investigations. The word Shuang Ta in historical records serves as an important clue. Today, there is still a village of this name near northern Beijing's Jingmi Aqueduct. The Jingmi Aqueduct, dug in 1960 and 112 kilometers long, remains one of the most crucial arteries for supplying water to Beijing. Working more than seven centuries ago, Guo Jing diverted the waters of Baifu Spring westward, following the foothills of Beijing's western hills to the south, until they reached Wangshan Lake. The water diversion route formed a C-shape, perfectly avoiding the depression of the valley. The route of the Jingmi Aqueduct, in fact, closely matches the description of Guo's Baifu Wangshan River, found in historical records. The Jingmi Aqueduct was completed with modern measurement techniques, by elite engineers of the People's Republic of China. How was it possible to construct a nearly identical waterway over 700 years ago? With the aid of surveying instruments and satellite positioning systems, engineers from the Beijing Water Authority can easily survey and determine the elevation of a specific point. Baifu Spring sits at an elevation of 55 meters, while Wangshan Lake is at 40 meters. The ancient route of the Baifu Wangshan River, which connected them, gradually descended along the 50 meter contour line between these two locations. 
在那个年代，如果没有借助这么多先进的仪器测绘的话，让我来干，我是不敢想象的，因为难度真的是特别特别的大。Without the aid of modern surveying technology, how did Guo Shoujing do it? During his work on water management in the Central Plains, he noticed that the Yellow River near Kaifeng had a fast flow due to its distant proximity to the sea, whereas rivers near Beijing flowed more slowly because they were closer to the sea. From this observation, he deduced that Beijing's elevation must have been lower than that of Kaifeng, assuming sea level as a base. This could be considered the first instance of the concept of elevation above sea level being proposed by a Chinese person 560 years before the German mathematician Gauss did it. And this was just the beginning. The real challenge lay in specific measurements. <laughs> Professor Edegong of Inner Mongolia Normal University has spent many years studying the history of Chinese science and technology. He has replicated a Song Dynasty leveling instrument based on descriptions found in the ancient military compendium, complete essentials for the military classics. Since the technological practices of the Yuan, Ming, and Qing dynasties essentially followed those of the Song Dynasty, he has deduced that Wu Jing likely used a similar instrument for his measurements. When surveying, the observer's eye aligns with the three floats and the numerical values on the scale rod, forming a straight line across these five points. During measurement, while the observer's position remains unchanged, the scale rod can be moved to various distances from the observer, such as 5 meters, 10 meters, and 15 meters, to take measurements at different points. With variations in terrain, the observer will read different height values from the scale rod. This is the basic principle of the leveling instrument. 最后测量这个水平其实不是测的海拔的高度，而是测的具体的这个高成差的。标杆别晃，哎，这稳住啊。Now, Professor E uses a modern optical leveling instrument to take the same readings. 误差是二点二毫米。嗯。这个我没想到，这个误差精度非常准。他们在现有的条件下，没有这个水银啊、真空那个办法做玻璃的那个气泡的情况下，能想到把这个这水槽那个面给它提高，提高一个让眼睛能观测的，然后又浓缩到一个这么非常便携的小东西，随时都能拿的东西，这个是古人的智慧。Using precise measurement techniques. To take advantage of broad changes in elevation, Guo Shoujing masterfully designed the C-shaped Baifu Wangshan River. This route harnessed water from multiple springs in the western hills, such as Emu Spring and Yuchuan Spring, channeling it into Wangshan Lake. As a result, the Tonghui River flourished from this abundant water source. Realized through Guo Shoujing's visionary planning, the Tonghui River stretched from Kunming Lake to the Grand Canal, nourishing the dry imperial city along its journey from the Nan Chang'e River through Zizhu Yuan Park to the Shi Cha High Waters. Today, alongside Hohai Lake, stands a statue of Guo Shoujing. His gaze is eternally fixed upon the water course he created. A world-renowned astronomer who pondered weighty questions of maths and the cosmos, 
also had a keen sense of the flow of rivers. In 1293, an ambitious project to relocate the Yuan capital was completed, from Shangdu, or Xanadu in today's Inner Mongolia, to Didu as Beijing was then named. In July of that year, Kublai Khan arrived. When he stood on central Beijing's Wanning Bridge, seeing so many ships from the south that they obscured the water's surface, he was overjoyed, and thus named the waterway Tonghui River. Wanning Bridge stands as a symbol of the Yuan Dynasty's aspiration for perpetual prosperity and invincibility. The course of history, however, does not bend to the will of feudal monarchs. The sailing ships, flowing water, and countless variables arising from the efforts of the people across a vast nation would collectively influence the destiny of this great waterway. In Jining, Shandong, the day begins for locals living beside the Grand Canal. Today, the provincial capital of Shandong, during the Yuan and Ming dynasties, the terrain around the city also posed a challenge to waterborne transportation. The Huitong River, as this section of the Grand Canal is referred to in China, slices through the foothills of the Taiyi Mountains in the center of Shandong. Characterized by its elevated middle section and lower elevations to the north and south, it features a height difference of about a dozen meters. This topography caused water flowing into the middle section of the canal to quickly drain away, making it shallow and difficult to navigate. To add to this, frequent droughts in Shandong during the Yuan Dynasty depleted such water sources, and breaches in the northern tributaries of the Yellow River often disrupted the canal's flow. As a consequence of these problems, the Yuan government opted to circumvent the Huitong River, favoring direct sea transport from the province of Jiangsu to the south of Shandong, to Tianjin to the north, instead. This decision dramatically reduced the Huitong's cargo traffic to just a tenth of the total volume handled by the rest of the canal system. Over time, the Huitong River fell into neglect, with significant portions becoming silted and unviable for navigation. In the early 15th century, the Ming Dynasty Emperor Yongle moved China's capital from Nanjing and Jiangsu to Beijing, increasing demand for canal transportation to the north. Coupled with the government's emphasis on inland waterway navigation, there was an urgent need to reopen the Huitong River. The difficult task of transporting goods overland for hundreds of kilometers across Shandong, from Jining in its south to Dezhou in its north, was exhausting for tens of thousands of laborers. So in 1411, the Ming Emperor Zhu Di decided to reconstruct the Huitong River. Song Li, his Minister of Works, was chosen for the task. Song Li had been promoted to Minister of Works in the second year of Zhu Di's reign. As such, he was in charge of the government's responsibilities for agriculture, water conservancy, civil engineering, construction, transportation, and state-run industries. Although little had been documented about his achievements at the time of his death, assessments of his contributions to the nation have improved rapidly over the century afterwards. Written under Zhu Di's successors, the official history of his reign is veritable records of Emperor Taizong of the Ming Dynasty. Remarkably, only one sentence in it mentions Song Li. Minister of Works, Song Li, supervised the reopening of the Huitong River. Song Li demonstrated remarkable efficiency in his work. Leading 160,000 laborers, he quickly dredged and widened the Huitong and repaired the Yuan Dynasty's Gongqing Dam, 
diverting the Dewan River to aid transportation. Given that he had no prior experience in water engineering projects, the quick progress he made early on was ample proof of his impressive capabilities as a manager. The challenge was far from over, however. After completing his initial tasks, Songli discovered that, despite the considerable manpower and resources that had been invested, the outcome was limited. While the canal's water level south of Jining was good, its channel north of Jining remained shallow and unnavigable. What was wrong? Today's Nanyang ancient town, located by Weishan Lake in the southeast of Jining, has abundant water sources. In contrast to the north of Jining, the banks of the Hui Tong are narrow, the water is shallow, and grass even grows on its bottom. This situation closely resembles the southern and northern slopes of a mountain. Nanwang Town, to the northwest of Jining, appears to be completely flat at first glance. In reality, it is the highest point along the entire Grand Canal. Rising and falling gradually over hundreds of kilometers, the canal's increase in elevation of a dozen odd meters to get to here is virtually indiscernible to the naked eye. Song Li was determined to make the water climb over the mountain. Thanks to guidance from a local expert, he was confident in accomplishing this technically demanding task, precisely positioning the canal's water source at the highest point of the area. The Dawan River was the most important water source for the northern section of the Huitong River during the Ming Dynasty. Today, every segment of it is managed by a river chief, who is very familiar with the local mountains and water dynamics. In the Ming Dynasty, local leaders who were knowledgeable about the principles of nature and manage rivers and water projects were referred to as seniors. At the time, a senior named Baying suggested to Songli that he divert water from the Dewan River to Nanwang, allowing the water to flow both south and north. Song Li followed by Ying's advice, diverting the water of the Dawan River to the highest point at Nanwang, successfully achieving a natural bifurcation that allowed water to flow freely to both the south and north. Moving the canal's water inlet to Nanwang, the highest point addressed a long-standing problem, but new challenges arose. The water channeled from Nanwang into the Huitong underwent a T-shaped bifurcation, improving water levels in the canal to both the north and south. But with the northern section of the canal severely lacking water, while to the south there was less of a problem, a new question emerged. How could more water be directed to flow northward? During the Daoguang period of the Qing dynasty, the governor general of Jiang Nan's waterways recorded the appearance of the Nanwang water divide in his archaeological travel notes. In addition to stationing officials to oversee the site around the clock, the government erected temples dedicated to the Dragon King and Yu the Great at Nan Wang, invoking divine favor for uninterrupted canal transportation. Today, 
the Nanwang Water Divide, has become the Grand Canal's most technologically significant heritage site. Of course, the water dividing structure could only work with a sufficient water source. After adopting Bai Ying's suggestion to divide the water at Nanwang, Songli collaborated with him again to build a dam at Daitsuan village. Back in the day, the Daitsuan dam directed water from the Daowen River into the Xiaowen River, which was then diverted to the Nanwang water divide. Compared to the Gengqing Dam of the Yuan Dynasty, which also utilized water from the Daowen River, the Daitsuan Dam was able to contribute a greater volume of water to the canal. After conducting a study of Song Li's water diversion works at Nanwang, Gao Yuanjia of Liaoqing University has come to appreciate the remarkable wisdom of the man who advised Song Li by ink. Shanwan With the Daitsuan Dam, Nanwang water diversion project's completion, the Huitong River once again became navigable, revitalizing the transportation of goods via the canal from the south to Beijing. Songli, having fulfilled his mission, moved on to other assignments, although after 10 years, he passed away from illness while still in office. His work at Nanyang amounted to an important contribution to the nation's economic development and overall strength. In the years following his death, however, he was in danger of being forgotten. It took nearly a century for the Ming government to fully acknowledge his historical impact, culminating in the establishment of a shrine at Nanwang in his honor. As for Bai Ying, he was deified by the local people as Lord Bai, becoming a symbol of the peace and prosperity brought by the canal. His work with Songli is one of the great collaborations in Chinese history. The canal flows on, bidding farewell to companions it once journeyed with. It has experienced periods of silence, before being revitalized and continuing forward, facing more challenges ahead. Standing by the canal today, it's not hard to imagine the thousands of boats that thronged it, carrying cargoes of supplies to the north from the fertile lands of the south. Before the waterway could attain this state, however, a further improvement was needed. Even after the Huitong was reopened, numerous boats heading north were still blocked at this critical stop within Shandong's borders. During the Ming and Qing dynasties, the ancient town of Jining, with its three main streets and six lanes, flourished for a period. When arriving in the town, those bringing cargo via water faced a choice. The elevation increase of over 10 meters in the canal segment north of Jining meant that barges could not naturally navigate through. Those coming from the opposite direction faced the same problem. Consequently, Jining became an essential stopover for passing vessels. 
Some chose to disembark and continue their journey via horse-drawn carriages, a solution that demanded considerable manpower and resources. More preferred to wait, joining queues for passage through the canal's locks. It is seldom level. In some places, there is little or no water, and the regulation of the water level is achieved by locks placed at intervals. During the Qianlong period of the Qing dynasty, the British McCartney Embassy passed through the Huitong River by boat and recorded the scene of passing through the locks. Deciding whether to switch to land transport or to wait for the lock gate's sequential opening involved a careful assessment of costs and time. The Jingmen Upper Lock is the best preserved control lock on the Huitong today. 800 meters away is its counterpart, the Jingmen Lower Lock. When no ships were passing through, both gates would be tightly closed, allowing the water level in the canal between them to be held constant. The lock gates were not single structures, but were made of multiple long wooden planks, which were carefully stacked and secured within the lock grooves from bottom to top. Long having disintegrated, the planks are no longer in place today. But the marks on the winding stones from where they were once anchored are still clearly visible. Once the lock gates were opened, there was a loss of water. So, the Ming and Qing governments established strict regulations for opening and closing them. Backed up by Song Li's water diversion and distribution project at Nanwang, the tiered locks of the Grand Canal's Huitong section across Shandong ensured a consistently navigable depth. Water, which by its very nature flows downwards, was held fixed along the route by a monumental feat of engineering. Resisting the nature of water was even harder when it flew in a mighty torrent. Built to protect the canal from the Yellow River, the 108-kilometer-long Taihang Dike in southwest Shandong now lies under a newly paved asphalt road. Its origins can be traced back to when the canal's Huitong section was reopened under the Ming Emperor Zhu Di. In those days, water management officials tried using the Yellow River to replenish the canal during periods of severe water scarcity. After a few decades, however, they realized the Yellow River's high sediment load was clogging up the canal, causing siltation and frequent breaches in the Huitong River. Eventually, the Ming government decided to build the Taihang Dike to restrain the flow of the Yellow River towards the northern part of Shandong. For more than 300 years thereafter, the Huitong River was no longer threatened by the Yellow River. The river's southward flow, however, would pose significant risks to the operation of another section of the canal. After setting out from Huayan New Port in northern Jiangsu, Shen Yunqing's cargo ship, laden with corn, stone, and industrial goods, has entered Grand Canal. Within minutes, it arrives at Wuher Ko, which means Mouth of Five Rivers. The five rivers include the Grand Canal, the Yellow River, the Huaishu New River, the Huaishu River, 
and the Yinha River. From this junction, ships can navigate northward to Shandong, southward to Yangzhou along the Grand Canal, or eastward to the sea via Lianyungong. Achieved through impressive engineering several centuries ago, the convergence of waterways facilitated water transportation, but it also brought with it unintended consequences. Shun Yunqing's cargo ship now crosses Hengzhe Lake from east to west along its southwest shore near Sui County, Huayan. Qingko, which lies close to Wuher Ko in the northeastern corner of Hengzhe Lake, served as an important junction during the Ming and Qing dynasties. It was here that the Yellow River converged with both its major tributary, the Huaihe River and the Grand Canal. Proceeding southeast from this meeting point was the Grand Canal's Huayang section. To the north flowed the Yellow River, while in the west the Huaihe River flowed out from Hengzhe Lake. The eastward route led to the Yellow River's estuary. By blocking the Yellow River's northward advance, the Taihang Dike forced its entire flow southwards through its main channel, introducing significant downstream risks. Renowned for its high sediment load, the Yellow River frequently broke its banks, causing breaches and floods along the route. Downstream, there was increasing siltation around Chinko and blockages along the canal's Huayang section. Siyang County, located upstream from Chinko, benefits from a warm climate and abundant water sources, making its soil well suited for rice cultivation. Nearby, however, the soil is very different. The sandy soil that is prevalent around here is a direct consequence of the Yellow River's frequent historical flooding. During the Ming Dynasty, canals dug across Siyang were fed by the Yellow River, causing frequent floods that destroyed homes and fields, leaving the population displaced. The recurring disasters prompted heated debates within the government about effective strategies for managing the Yellow River. The divergence in strategies reflected a difference in priorities and perspectives, ensuring the smooth operation of the canal system to guarantee supplies to the imperial city seemed like a more reasonable choice for senior officials. In contrast, advocates for a comprehensive management strategy, represented by the government minister Pan Jishuan, aim to tackle both the immediate challenges and the underlying problems, with the system made up of the Yellow River, the Huaihe River, and the Grand Canal. This approach took into account the well-being of the people, but it would require a substantial investment of time and labor. Additionally, it would also cause a short-term loss in transportation capacity. Reality dealt Pan Jishuan a harsh blow when his political rivals found an excuse to impeach him, resulting in his removal from office. The forces of nature, of course, are oblivious to human disputes and the interests of dynasties. Over the years that followed, as the officials who favored digging new canals and bypassing the Yellow River assumed control, conditions within the Yellow River, the Huaihe River, and the Grand Canal Basin worsened significantly, bringing canal transportation to a near standstill. Pan Jishuan understood the nature of water. The Yellow River, stretching thousands of kilometers across the Chinese landscape like a yellow dragon, carries immense energy. He knew that, Harnessing this energy was the best way to tame this dragon. At the Shaolang D Dam on the Yellow River, annual water and sediment regulation is underway. Created by controlled releases, an artificial flood peak uses massive water flow to carry away sediment, 
reducing the risk of siltation. The techniques of sediment management advocated by Pan Jishuan, in fact, are similar to the more scientific approach adopted today. Pan Jishuan just thinks that the water is equal, the water is equal, the water is equal, the water is equal, the water is equal. So he wants to get the water to be equal, and the water is equal to get the water to the water to the water. Addressing sedimentation was crucial, but preventing flooding was equally vital. Over 500 years ago, there were no hydraulic engineering projects based on modern technology. Pan Jishuan, however, had devised methods of his own. This is the comprehensive map of river defense, personally created by Pan Jishuan. The winding river in the center of the map is the Yellow River constrained by embankments known as thread dikes. Beyond these, lower embankments, called distant dikes, serve as a final barrier against the flooding of the Yellow River. The vertical lines between the thread and distant dikes are known as partition dikes. They act to reduce the force of the water and protect both the thread and distant dikes. This is where Pan Jishuan can find water to combat sediment. 从地形地貌上看，应该可以确认这个我们现在所站的地方就是吕堤。村庄的这个二层楼左右是跟这个堤顶相平的，那么更远的窑堤呢，应该在两三公里之外，现在已经看不见了。潘继逊治河的时候，曾经有十多年黄河没有泛滥，这个在明代是非常难得的一段时间，所以他就在《总理河潮奏书》中旗帜鲜明地提出了。主堤溯水，治河要策，这重要的八个字。Originally, the estuary of the Yellow River was at Yunti Pass, close to what is now Yancheng in Jiangsu. After two centuries, however, Yunti Pass was more than 65 kilometers from the sea. Most of the land in Shaoyang County of Jiangsu owes its formation to sediment deposited by the Yellow River. A result of Pan Jishuan's strategy of confining water to combat sedimentation. Historically, the Huaiha River basin was fertile and prosperous. But after the diversion of the Yellow River, because of the Yellow River's higher water levels and stronger flow, at its confluence with the Huaiha River, the Huaiha River was forced into a gradual retreat. This resulted in Hengzhe Lake often being backfilled and overrun by the Yellow River's waters. Flooding of the Huaiha River, meanwhile, frequently disrupted the lives of people living close to it. To address this, Pan Jishuan proposed another key strategy for river management. This was to store clear water to clear away the Yellow River sediment. To counter the forceful encroachment of the Yellow River, his plan was to elevate the water level of Hengzhe Lake. To achieve this, he began constructing what he envisioned as a great wall in the water, along the eastern shore of Hengzhe Lake, which later came to be known as Gaojia Yin Weir. Zhoujiao Da Tang is a representative of the Gaojia Yin Weir. Only the government has such a size. One piece of wood is built by a thousand pieces of wood. 那么这个结构呢，非常的合理，有面石、里石两层石头，石头后面是桩，桩后面是山河土，山河土后面才是原来的土，它就形成了一个非常缓和的过渡带，能够消除水浪冲击的阴力。Upon the initial construction of the high weir, Chinko became unobstructed, with a smooth flow for years without significant troubles in the river channels. This is what history of Ming says about Gao Jia Yin Weir. The officials who had once harbored doubts and skepticism about Pan Jishuan later came to admire his unwavering commitment to truth and his dedicated service to the country, acknowledging him as a loyal and honest official. We may never know what Pan Jishuan would have thought upon hearing such starkly contrasting evaluations. Perhaps he wouldn't have cared at all. Throughout the construction of Gao Jia Yin, he braved harsh conditions, living among the laborers at the worksite without fear of the biting wind and chill. 
Later in life, Pan Jishuan reflected on his career in river management with the words, I grew in this work. I aged in this work. I spent my mornings in this work. I spent my evenings in this work. During the Ming and Qing dynasties, the Qingko water transport hub gradually took shape. With its integration of the Yellow and Huaiha rivers, with the Grand Canal and Hengzhe Lake, it secured the stability of inland waterborne freight and the livelihoods of the local population for centuries. Over periods of time long enough to witness the rise and fall of dynasties, however, no solution is everlasting. With Gao Jia Yin Weir being continuously built up, Hongzhe Lake gradually expanded towards the southwest. In 1680, Sijo City and the Ming ancestral tombs located on its southwestern shore were submerged beneath its waters. Nearly three centuries later, during a dry season of the 1970s, the large stone statues of the Ming ancestral tombs were exposed to the sunlight once again, although the ruins of Sijo City remain hidden beneath the water to this day. Loss and gain are both part of life. The struggle between humans and nature gives rise to wisdom and civilization, in addition to highlighting the balance between sacrifice and acquisition. Pan Jishuan was once asked whether he believed in the existence of the river god. He replied, the river god is nothing more than the very nature of water itself. For him, the river god was simply another term for laws of nature. Great rivers have nurtured Chinese civilization. Alongside them, the Grand Canal has demonstrated Chinese ingenuity and innovation. It has shown how human actions can transform civilization into a more refined and complex form. The Great Canal Engineering Projects of the Yuan, Ming, and Qing dynasties stand as high points in Chinese hydraulic engineering technology, representing the world's most outstanding water management planning and the most comprehensive hydraulic projects before the modern age. From its completion 14 centuries ago onwards, engineers of different dynasties continuously maintained, repaired, and transformed the Grand Canal. Comparing their successes and failures requires extensive evaluation. All the way through, this longest of man-made rivers has connected China's north and south all the while linking up countless seemingly unrelated people and events. The persistence, the choices made, the contradictions faced, the struggles, and the sacrifices all weave together as reflections on the meaning of life. In 1977, the International Astronomical Union, named asteroid 2012 Guashou Jing, in honor of the of the Yuan Dynasty engineer who, in addition to his achievements in astronomy, also brought the Grand Canal into the imperial capital. Seen from the darkness of space, the monumental waterway still cuts a groove across eastern China as one of the greatest achievements of pre-industrial civilization.